Join us on our website at www.thegrandview.org and get more information about our show. There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting. So last week we made a pledge on doing homework assignments. Oh, that's why. What was I thinking? What were you thinking? I raised my hand when you said six. It's like it's all I could do to get like a little bit done. You thought it was way harder than what it actually was. It was easy because it was a small area to cover. Yeah, you know, sometimes those little paintings are take as much time. And the yeah. thing is, you know, I, I always say you should sell your paintings by a square inch. But sometimes when I'm working on little paintings, I'm not going to get paid for the amount of time that it takes. And sometimes if you're going to do a study, see, you thought you could, like, divert the homework assignment by painting little. And yet the act of painting little is so hard that you futz and fiddle so much mm -hmm. that you would have been better off painting big. Yeah. Now. When we paint small paintings, we use small brushes. And when we paint bigger paintings, we use bigger brushes. And so the ratio to brush to canvas really doesn't matter. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to do these small little tiny paintings because they won't take so long, you're probably better off using an 8x10, 9x12 and use a bigger brush. It would take you equally as long. In fact, it probably end up being more, um, more practical. And if you're seriously thinking about doing painting for a career, which I know some of you are thinking about, there's a certain price point where you just don't go that small because the work is, is, takes so much. So, you know, you kind of have to figure a 16 by 20 sells for $1,500 or $1,000 or $800. That's better time spent than spending on a little 5 by 7 and sell it for $80. Because remember too is that people, people are impacted by size. Size matters, especially when it comes to painting. And you know, if you're in a gallery and you see little tiny paintings, people don't quite think of them as being so significant. So it's kind of better to, to, to do larger pieces. The only time I really recommend doing these small pieces is if you're traveling through Europe and you've got the little thumb box and you want to do a collection of thumb box paintings and then you're not going to sell them, you're going to put them down your hallway. So size does matter if you're going to, if you're going to be thinking about this. And if you're going to go to Europe, small little canvases, that makes sense because you've got to travel with them. But to do them as homework assignments, I probably would suggest to go larger. Hmm? Yeah. Yay. Yeah, because it's kind of really annual to paint small. And if you do really fabulous, some of your homework assignments are fabulous. So how many of you felt it was unreasonable to ask for seven paintings in seven days? Totally unreasonable, yeah. yeah. Imagine Molly and Dottie, I mean, they were, did 30 in 30 days. So our hat's off to you. Now we understand <laughs> what a uh, commitment that takes to do something like that. Yeah. What we want to do is we want to really understand what the process is. It's not the finished product that I care about. And when all of you kind of came in and I was hearing all the mulling over and like, oh, 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 I don't care about the finished product. What are we doing? We're practicing. Remember I told you that story last week about my mom being German? She says, get into that room and practice your piano. Mm -hmm. And then she said, practice the saxophone. And then she found other things for me to do that I needed to practice on. But my mom was, she sat there and said, a half an hour here, half an hour there. She was committed that I do that. But the thing is that daily, daily exercise of practicing really makes a difference. I see that with some of my students because not only did this class take this on, my other classes took this exercise on too. And they're seeing how beneficial it is to have the eye-brain hand coordination working. And oftentimes it's just that practice that we're practicing, not the final outcome.
Now some of you didn't quite understand the homework assignment my request, so whatever shows up is perfectly fine. If you did four paintings of, of the cosmetics, which was the theme, and you ended up doing something else, that's a homework too. Why do I give out these homework assignments? Why do I have you paint cosmetics? Because I just want to give you a topic and have you just dwell on it. If you came back and said, you know, I really, really hate cosmetics. I decided to paint birthday cakes. I would say, fine, at least you're painting. It doesn't matter. It's just real hard sometimes when we're looking at a theme if everybody's all over the place. Mm -hmm. So if we just have one little central focus point, you know, one little high, those are the ideas. But it's really great. It is about the practicing that really makes a difference. The more you practice, the better you get. And I just want you guys to get really good. Ken, who's doing that project that I told you last time, he's, Ken is doing a painting a day, and he's absolutely flabbergasted. Now, his, his subject matter is to have something happen outside of the painting that affects the painting itself, which is a really difficult goal to, to get to. And he's not painting them small, he's painting some little larger pieces. But I talked with him Saturday, because that's his coaching day. We were talking about his painting and I've been trying to get him to be more motivated and selling his work and sharing it and stuff. I got a text from him yesterday saying, uh, day before yesterday, he said, okay, I've decided after doing this, this experiment, I'm going to become a professional artist. And he says, do I, need my, do I need my business license? Do I need this or do I need that? And I said, no, don't worry about that yet. He says, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to become this. And it's only because I think through the exercises, he's starting to get the confidence that, yeah, he can sit down and paint anything. I mean, wouldn't that be powerful if something were sat in front of you and you know you, you could paint it? Do you think watching people on YouTube is going to give you the ability to be able to do that? You know, I had a bunch of new coaching students today that started today. So I got up at 4 a.m. this morning. That's when my Wednesdays start now. And so I have a whole group of new coaching students today. And I gave them the first class. And some of these students have been in classes and workshops. But the big thing that all of my coaching students have in common, they spend a lot of time watching YouTube videos. And how do you know I know that? That's how they found me. <laughs> So I tell them, don't watch any other videos except mine, you'll be fine. <laughs> but the thing is, I ask them, so did, after our, our talk, which is a half an hour long, I said, did you learn that from anybody on YouTube yet? And they said, no. I said, do you think you could find that information on anywhere in YouTube? YouTube? And they go, no. I said, so searching out there looking for YouTube videos to, to try to learn how to paint is futile. How he paints is no way that you're going to be painting. How you paint. It's extraordinary. Have you seen her paintings lately? This I, gal? I went to the show. I was in the show. Beautiful. See how good you would be if you stayed in class more consistently? <laughs> she's she's pressure, pressure. crazy she's one. And she has, she has talent. His father was a painter. Uh, it doesn't roll off the tree that way. She's got, <laughs> she's got passion. And the main thing that you need for painting is desire. Mm -hmm. That really is yes. the key. My job as a coach is to, is to create desire in you. So these talks are not only just about your painting thing, but I'm trying to turn you on. In painting, that is. <laughs> um, I'm trying to turn that switch that says, you know, I want to do this. When my coaching students come back like Kenny, he goes, I want to become a professional artist. I am really inspired to do this. It's fun to be able to sit down and paint something. And last night, um, he sent me a text going, I don't get it. And I go, I text him back. This is like 11 o'clock at night. I text him back. So what do you don't get? He goes, why is it that I look at something and it looks horrible and everybody in my family thinks it's great? <laughs> they think it's the best thing I've ever done. So I asked him to text it to me. And I said, you're just too close to it. You're just too close to it. What he did was actually really, really nice. I could see why his family really liked it. But the thing is, what happens as you start working is that your anticipation of where you want to be clouds 
what you're actually doing. You're actually working on paintings, trying to get them done to have a product or something like that. But it's the process of doing that. When you get good at that, you'll find the pleasure of doing this. And then it's like reading a book instead of writing a book. You'll enjoy actually painting. That's the secret to painting, is practice. And everything that you really need is right in front of you. When I do go through my coaching students, and you know, we do talk about Mrs. Gugolinsky, and, and I'll ask them, so, what were you thinking? And they start thinking, I'm like going, are we looking at the same picture? Their concept of what they're seeing is so, so out of joint to what's actually there. And so when we start talking about the temperatures and values to a painting and then talk about it, it's like, it's like a light switch turns on in them. They go, oh wow, you just took away everything I thought I knew about painting in a half hour. And I said, well, I imagine every half hour for the rest of your life, once a week, it's like it's going to be amazing. So it's really an amazing thing to be able to practice, but you've got to practice. Most of you that do practice in this class have gotten further ahead than the ones that don't. How many did you play? I wanted to do at least three, but I was on drugs all week. <laughs> you and Mary. Ever since they make California, California's got you know pot now. Everybody's smoking. And I just hibernated for the whole week. So we got colds and stuff. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, sometimes it, you just don't feel like painting. But when you do, that desire is what you want. So, um, so anyway, any other questions? Any insights? My yeah. question was, immediately before I even started, was um, cosmetics are very small. I'm thinking of a tube of lipstick, and then I'm thinking, since you have to paint in life size, you kind of want to paint it too big. Mm -hmm. And I, that was a bit of a dilemma for me at first. I mean, I got through it, but... I wasn't sure if I could paint like a big lipstick or... Uh, this, is where, this is where you're taking, taking what I say literally. Yeah. Okay, so my rule is that you don't want to paint anything larger than life size. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's a rule that I have. And the reason why I have that rule is because if you're painting a, a face on a wall and you paint it a little bit larger than life size, or some people paint twice the life, life size, to somebody walking up, it's freakish. It's like something that you know and all of a sudden, it's so big. You did portrait classes this week. Did she mention anything about life size or smaller? Yes, and if you make a woman's face larger than life size, it makes them more masculine. Mm -hmm. And if you make a child larger than the appropriate size for the age, it makes, it makes them a little older. older. Mm -hmm. And what happens if you make a man larger than life size? He just becomes better. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you want more of me? No. Uh, so anyway, so strike that. Um, so anyway, so but the thing is, if you make something like size, uh, it's because you're having this relationship with it. Um, when you're doing oranges, and you do oranges bigger than life size, they look like grapefruits. Yeah. And so if you're going to do large oranges, you put them next to something that people can relate to, like a silver dollar or a dollar bill. And then that gives us a scale of what we're looking at. Okay? You put a large orange close, a uh, small orange, and then a large orange. Is no, because, well, then it can look like a grapefruit and a, and a, you know, so you don't want to, if you like fruit, like fruit not. And you run into a problem if you're going to do an orange and a Japanese teapot because the Japanese teapot tend to be small and all of a sudden that orange starts to look like a grapefruit because out west we think of teapots being bigger. So you run into a size problem. But I don't think anybody would really run into a problem if you made lipstick bigger than life size. That's kind of an object that pretty much isn't bigger than life size. Unless you see some of the gals that sing on music videos where they blow up their lips like crazy and they probably need a stick like this to <laughs> put around their lips. But the thing is, things like that, you could go larger. Okay, that answers my question. So if you did bigger lipstick, bigger compact and stuff, because those are s s trained in our brain. And if it's bigger, it looks just more popish. Yeah. Okay. So it just looks like more pop art. So it looks more like Andy Warhol kind of thing. Okay. So that's perfectly f okay, reasonable. But there is something to say about having empty space. 
If you did an 8x10 and you put just a, a little thing of lipstick with the lid next to it and then had beautiful red fabric and the light coming through and hitting that in a lot of quiet space, that could be really great. Cluttering up a small little canvas just makes more clutter. So size does matter. You know, and canvas quality matters. Some of you painted on canvas, canvas boards with all the bumps. That sucks in the paint faster. The bumps detract from the overall surface. You're better off on a board at that size. Whose is this? Do you hear the group? You know, when you nail it, you nail it. Not every painting you're going to do is going to be great. And you know this. And if you don't believe me, come to my house. I'll be happy. No, actually, I won't show it to you because I'm just like all of the other imposters out there. I don't want to show you all of my other work, but I can show you where it's all stored and you'll see it all packed up. At one point, I was in San Francisco and periodically artists need to purge. And some of you probably have gone through this, especially if you're moving. And you look at all of these canvases that you do. They were really great ideas, but weren't. And so what I did was I ended up putting them all in my truck, driving down to the dump, and I'm tossing these big paintings, because I don't know B, I don't want to have anybody come across them, right? And I'm tossing these big, huge canvases out into the dump. And I look, this is back when they had dumps. You know, so I look across the way, and there's another pickup truck over there with an artist doing the exact same thing, throwing canvases into the dump. <laughs> Um, so you will have lots of those. All artists do. You if you don't, huh? Why didn't you burn them? You live in the city. You yeah, it's not like it could just you burn them. them. I could have, I could have cut them up, but I thought going to the dump would be a, a sure thing. It was a purge thing. It was a purge. It's you, sometimes it's liberating, you know. Yeah. Sometimes it's liberating just to take a, a, a razor blade and just cut it. <laughs> ah. Wow. I did that for a demo once because we were going through. Uh, fixing people's paintings to show them for an art club. So everybody brought their dogs and I would sit there and paint on them. And then I brought one of my dogs. They didn't know it was my dog, but you know. And so I said, you know, sometimes you just have to get rid of a painting. And I reached up there and took a razor blade and cut it. And everybody in the room gasped as if I, I, I went across the Mona Lisa. Yeah. But the thing is, it feels good to do that. You know, if you've got burdened paintings, throw them out. Don't have them around because your kids will eventually get them. Well, and what happened with, huh? Right. When, yeah. you're, when you're gone and you don't want people to see those paintings, everybody's going to be snatching them up. That's right, right. And, it's like, best ones and you know what I've found because I've had right. students that passed away that have been with me because of the amount of years I've been teaching? <clears throat> their family doesn't really care about their work till they die. And all of a sudden, they start beating themselves up over which paintings they're going to get. Because it's the only thing that you do that is yours. Yeah. More than the needle point, more than anything. It's the paintings they fight over. The gold and silver, yeah, you know, you'll have a lawyer to take care of that. But that personal, like, this is mom's painting. I want to give it to my you know, grandson. So it's really important. But what happened with my paintings that I went to the dump is that I have a habit of writing my phone number and name in the back of the canvases because I move around a lot, right? Before I even start, I just kind of go through and do that. Well, six months later, I get a phone call from somebody and he said, would he mind if, if uh, he finishes my painting? I said, what painting? And he described it and it was one of the paintings I threw out. I said, where did you get that? He says, at the San Jose flea market. <laughs> so the scavengers were pulling up all these paintings and putting them out. So you never know. You, when you think you've gotten rid of it, it keeps coming back. <laughs> so anyway. Beautiful. Yeah. Maybe so. I, maybe it was no, no. He said he bought a whole bunch of them because they were in the flea market. He spent he spent three dollars a piece. No, three dollars a piece. The guy that was throwing his canvases away waited till you left. Then he went and dug through yours and took them. Quite possible, but he looked like he was an artist too. I mean, you know, we understand that purge, you know. So, um, but he paid three dollars a piece for them. So. Yeah. Anyway. Do you ever paint over anything? I mean, you know, you it has bad it? karma. <laughs> you know, a canvas is what most people spend anywhere from five to ten dollars for a canvas. I spend thirty to fifty dollars a canvas. I spent yesterday going to get a hamburger at just a normal little charbroil place was 
fifty dollars. What? Yes, it's in Wairika. It's a chart house or whatever. Fifty dollars for two. Oh. Okay. Plus French fries. Yeah. Plus <laughs> coffee. But anyway, plus a tip. Plus you know, but the things. But what I'm saying is that you know where that's that hamburger is ending up today, <laughs> right? But a canvas will last you forever. Why have a? Spend more in the canvas. You have a problem with what I'm saying. <laughs> You know, you know the answer, you just don't want to blurt it out. But a canvas will last forever. The thing that I find is that canvases get souls. And when you get something that's not working, and you put something else on top of it, and then it starts bleeding through and starts bothering, it's like, no, it's always nice to start fresh. Treat yourself to a new canvas. Treat yourself, and throw away bad things. If it's not working, don't fix it. Throw it away. Okay, whose is this? Uh, Grizel. Grizel, how many paintings did you get done? How many did you pledge? Six. Where's the other two? They're still up here and going to be on my canvas. No. When you make a pledge, you stick with that pledge. You can't back pledge because you're going to make another pledge today. Yeah, well, it was a learning experience. In fact, I'm even requesting my family on YouTube under the comment section of this video. I want them to make a pledge to me how many paintings they can do in a week, and then I want you to follow up on that. And that's for my YouTube family. Go and pledge and paint what you say you're going to do and be part of this. See, here again too, I'm not feeling light as an energy. I'm just feeling that things are lit up. There's a difference between having light that comes into a painting like a flashlight, which some people are using to highlight their, their paintings, but a flashlight. That's an energy that's, that's, that's coming into the painting. It's intruding into the painting. When you just light things like this, this is not, that's not. Yeah. But see, the thing is, it's, you're showing us a great example. Now, now, I want you to notice, look at how many conversations we're having because we have so many homework assignments. If we had this many homework assignments by everybody every week, imagine the stuff that you would learn just by showing painting after painting after painting after painting. So not only are you doing four or five paintings that you are trying to, to accomplish with your pledge, but you get the benefit of seeing everybody else's four or five paintings. And they're all of the same subject matter. And it's so the way people come to things is different. Whose is this? Look at that lighting effect, that reflective light. It's almost like the thing itself is alive. Okay. One important thing is that you paint it the way you see it. Now that you were doing that still life today and I said that's not what you want to do. You're painting a still life and then you change the background to blue. If you want to do that, you take a sheet of blue and you put it background. You don't guess. You guys don't have enough experience to know what happens to color when you change it. And so by changing the background is instant death. Everything that you want to put into the painting should be exactly the way that you want to render it. Um, I blue because of the orange. I wanted to have blue and orange. Yeah, and I, I mean that's a really great concept. Not always a good idea. No, I'd much rather see these bottles if they were on a, a, a mossy green, you know, or white, even a white tablecloth, because then we could see the beautiful lighting effect. We do have the, the one center focal point, but it's just stuck there. Yeah. You know, so you have to have some, some uh, lighter, cooler background colors so you could get the eye into the back so you could get some magnets and stuff. So this one's just kind of stuck. Whose is this? It's my Sharon's. Got the Sharon. Got the Sharon thing going here. Sharon. Sharon understands magic and light. When I, we write our artist statement, uh, you know, I always throw, you know, awe and wonder and magic. You know, that's that's really a key to get into your painting some magic. And Sharon always gets a beautiful magic of light. And we have the beautiful cast shadow of the brushes on the wall. The wall's lit up there because the light's coming, um, hitting the glass, the light and the lipstick. What I love about it is that energy right in that corner there, that energy of the horizontal plane, which if the light's hitting just right becomes the center focal point, the most intense thing. And then look at her transition. Like energy itself, it just... Good job. Who's this? Here again, too, what she's actually done is she's taken the effect of light and put it behind the object, almost obscuring the, the, the
the uh, effect to, to go in between. And that creates a wonderful thing. Your central focal point doesn't have to be even lit on the thing. It just can be just the effect of light. And one of my students up in Medford, she's a pro at this. She never gets light to sit on any object. It's always on the table and how it bounces off the table. Key. You have to set it up the way you're going to paint it. And one of my coaching students this morning didn't. And so he started getting light on everything. He's like, oh, you know, you want a central light and all that stuff? It's like, no, because he didn't set it up. And some of my students have realized it really is about the light. And if you're having a problem getting this effect, you have to be thinking about your light source. You have to make that happen. You can't make it up. You'll never get it right. Whose is this? Mine, Sharon. How many did you do? Five. How many you pledge? Five. Five. All right. Good. <laughs> but if you notice, she's always come with homework. <clears throat> you know, and oftentimes I hear a story from her. Uh, I'm so tired. I didn't start the homework till two in the morning. And I just got done. She didn't sleep all night. That's desire. And I don't think she's doing it to show off. I think she's doing it because she knows she's going to get better doing it. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Look at the cast shadow and the highlight. Mm -hmm. Boom. I mean, wow, that's got energy to it. These are going to be a beautiful little set for your one woman show. <laughs> no, I mean, think about it. All beautiful little silhouettes. And I can tell you because the price points of these, you put these up and say, hey, this is available at a certain price. I bet you'd be surprised on Facebook that they'll actually be bought up. Because people can relate to this kind of subject matter. I want to paint. I'm going to, my goal is to try to paint. Every, every day. day. For five days a week, at least. That doesn't go so so long. See, yeah. yeah. But see, the thing is, yeah. she made an important, she just, she made an important, important commitment to yeah. the group, yeah. to paint five days a week. Yeah. And you really, it's like riding your bicycle, and the more you do it, the better you get, the easier, and it really helped to, you know, all day long. Of course, you can't do that, but just doing some every day. Just Sometimes the sheer exhaustion has you get yourself out of the way. And when I used to take students to Yosemite, the first day we would do one or two paintings, the second day we did 15. By the end of that afternoon, people were so pissed off at me because I would have them set up, take down, move, set up, take down, move, set up, take down, move, all day long, that they were throwing paint on the canvas because they were so ticked off. And they thought that everything was coming out bad, but then we brought everything back to the studio. It was marvelous, the stuff that they were doing, because they weren't thinking about it. They just started doing it. And when you're painting every day, you stop being anal and you just kind of get the paint on and you start going into this mode where you start seeing the object is the brain hand eye coordination there is no substitute for that there is no substitute for that that's the practice that I'm talking about Expanded instructional DVDs that feature an hour-long demonstration of today's painting and other paintings in the series are available at the Grandview by calling 1-800-511-1337. Join us on our website, thegrandview.org, and get more information about our show. There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting, along with a free diagram of today's subject.
Stefan Bauman's The Grand View is funded in part by PaintingFromNature.com A website for artists seeking inspiration, advice, and knowledge to master painting from nature. PaintingFromNature.com